Dear friends, good evening. Thank you for joining us this week to another lecture in our Pre-Chamber series. Let's talk tonight about this thing called the phenomena of death. And as you have seen and learned from us, we like to start our Pre-Chamber lectures always with a quote from Master Samael Aumbeor. And Samael says, People do not care to really understand the deep significance of death. All people really care for is to continue in the afterlife, and that's it. Now we need to hear these words, and we need to make sure that we somehow internalize them, because we cannot allow ourselves to live this existence only caring for the opportunity to continue in the afterlife. That would be completely superficial. It would render our life insufficient and we will not be able to make the radical transformation that is necessary. We need to understand what is this thing called death and the connotations of death because this phenomena of death goes beyond the physical effect of a body that no longer is giving an indication of vital signs of breathing and of any type of brain activity. So let's start, as we go into this topic of the phenomena of death, let's start by understanding what exactly are we? We have seen in the sacred writings across all of the world's great religions that God, this concept of the Creator, is a multiple perfect unity. And we have also learned that there is a hermetic principle that is called the principle of correspondence that states that as above, so below. So if that source of creation is a multiple perfect unity, meaning that that source of creation is a combination, a harmonious combination of many things, then while we are here, inhabiting these bodies, we are also a combination of things. And we're going to start by saying that in terms of that multiplicity, we are a soul, we are a physical body, and we are a vital body as well. This physical body is very easy to detect it and perceive it. Because we have senses, and it is through the physical body that we receive information and impressions from the environment. We can see them, we can hear them, we can taste them, we can smell them, we can touch them. Even though our physical senses are somehow subjective, we can perceive and get a lot of information from the environment, and we get that information from the receptors that exist in the body. But also, we are a soul. And even though we inhabit in this physical body, we all have this notion that within us, there is this thing that in quantum physics they refer to as the observer. And you know very well that that observer is present. And you have experienced that observer many times particularly those instances where there is a recurrent thought, a thought that just continues to repeat itself over and over and over again, and somehow you're saying, why is it that this thought doesn't go away? Well, evidently, there is an observer that have, has perceived the existence of that recurrent thought. And if that observer within you that you know intimately that is you did not put that thought, then it is clear that there has been a thinker inhabiting within the realm of the mind of the machine that has not been discovered yet. So we have this soul. We have this element of the observer, and we also have those thinkers that bring thoughts. We have those thinkers that elaborate certain words and certain actions that after we exercise them through the body, we say, oops, that is not really what I wanted to say. 
or that is not what I wanted to do, or, or that is not what I intended to see happening. So that is giving us an indication that there is a very subtle aspect of us that exists within us, that we identify with as that self. But there are also other aggregates that exist within the mind that have influence over that self and that as a consequence have influence over the body. For our purposes, even though at the very advanced levels, Samael is very clear telling the students, yes, we don't have a lunar soul. <laughs> he says that very, very clearly. Uh, he says, we don't have a lunar astral body. Let's refer to this soul as our astral body. Let's refer to this soul as an astral body that is of a lunar nature. Because in this soul, we have our consciousness. But that consciousness is not integral. You see, it is not like a single thing. It is more like many fractions of consciousness trapped in many different aspects of our own selves. So within that soul, we have all of our fears and all of our desires. But we also have our mind in that soul. We also have our emotions expressed through that soul. We have even our willpower expressed to the soul itself. So we have this soul inside of which there is a consciousness and we have this body. And that soul inhabits in the body, but that soul has no ability to keep that body alive. That physical body needs of something else. And it needs of an ethereal double. Depending on where you go, that ethereal double, some people may call it the rainbow body, other people may call it the subtle body. It has many names, but it is an ethereal body. It is a body made of ether. In reality, it's four ethers. And this ethereal body is what infuses life and vitality on the dense substance that makes up the physical body. This ethereal body is responsible for your thinking processes, for your ability to perceive. It is responsible for your biological processes, for your processes of reproduction. And it is even responsible for all of the electrochemical processes that take place in the body itself. So we have a physical body that we have been given as a vehicle so that we can maneuver around and exist in this plane. And there is a vital body that keeps our physical body alive. And then there is a soul. And inside that soul, a consciousness. An observer that comes to live and experience through the vehicle that is the human body itself. This is what we are. And this thing called a consciousness the essence, that light aspect of the soul, that consciousness is the material that we have been given so that we can fabricate a radiant soul. A soul that is not mechanical and lunar, but a soul that is radiant, that has developed an independent mind, that has received faculties that are the faculties of our own spirit, of our own innermost, faculties that we can observe in great masters, in angels, in archangels, initiates, etc. So this is what we are. We are a combination of three. Again, a physical body with a vital body and the soul. But we are here not to continue expanding on what is it that we are in our body. Now we're here to speak about the phenomena of death. So what happens with these three things at the time that the angel of death comes around and says, time's up, time to move on. Samael tells us death is a mathematical operation. 
And that means that there are a series of positive values that we carry within, and there are also negative values. The negative values, they're easy to see because you can look at your anger and, well, you know how destructive that can be. Maybe you have experienced greed or very strong ambition and you can see how destructive that can be. We have seen lust. And lust does not care about finances and personal commitments. Lust does not care about where it is, what time it is, or with whom it is interacting. Lust does not care if it is the work environment, if it is a church, if it is a hospital, or if it is somewhere in a hidden alley. All that lust cares for is for the satisfaction of its desires. And we have seen how many people have seen their marriages destroyed. How many people have lost their jobs? How many people have brought misery and misfortune into their lives? All because of lust. So yeah, we can see the negative values very, very easy. But we also have positive values. And our positive values are more in the likes of a flavor of altruism. There are some positive values that have a deep flavor of spirituality. There are some values that, that have a, an essence of compassion and kindness. But you know that it is those aggregates, those values operating, because when they operate, they are looking to do good, but they don't do good when good has to be done. And when they do it, they do good at a time when good shouldn't be happening, and thus they create problems too. And a good example of this is those uh, aspects of ourselves that are altruistic. Those are very positive egos. But in that altruism, you may be walking down the street and somebody may come around. This is a true story. We just witnessed this. Not too long ago, uh, our friend was walking down a plaza and he came across this woman who was walking around carrying a baby and she was crying and she was asking for someone to give her some money so that she could feed the baby. She was hungry. And our friend, altruistic, put his hand in his pocket and gave a little contribution to the woman. But then... Some time later, our friend was walking down the same path and came across the same woman with the same story, with the same tears, asking for the same contributions. And when our friend looked, that was not a baby. It was a doll. It so happens that this woman happened to be with a man and they were orchestrating this drama together. So they were investing all of this effort in this act, in this drama, to be able to generate some income, perhaps having the ability to use that very same energy in something that would have been more constructive, that would have been able to help others. And we can see here how those positive aspects of us well, they want to do good, but they don't do good when the good should be done. And when they do it, well, certainly the good happens when it is not necessary. So they just don't know. And as a mathematical operation, we come into the tapestry of existence. And at some point, we have to realize what is it that we have and what is it that we're missing. So that when we are ready to leave, when the angel of death comes, and it is time for our soul to to leave the physical body behind and continue that we can once again redo that inventory and realize how much have we gotten rid of and how much we have gained throughout this experience that is called life. This is why death is a mathematical operation. We have to reconcile what we brought and what we are taking with us, and hopefully the sacrifices that we go through here, the efforts that we put working with the creative energy that we have been given, and the powers of the consciousness become used in such a way that we can bring about the elimination of those inferior aspects that exist within us. Doing all that, we should be able to leave in a better condition than when we got here.
ideally that is part of the goal of life. This is why death is referred to as a mathematical operation. But this thing of death, when the angel of death shows up and the angel of death takes action, something happens to the soul, to the body, and to the ethereal body. The first thing is that the soul is connected to the physical body. Every night, well, you have unfolded in your astral body. So yes, you are out lingering in the fifth dimension in, in that soul, in that lunar soul. And as you're there, well, you always come back into your physical body simply because your soul is connected to the body by a silver thread that in the Hindu tradition they call the thread of Antakarana. This is a silver thread that has the ability to expand itself to the very edges of the infinite and bring you back. Every time that you unfold in your astral body, you all, you all you need to do is shake your physical body a little bit. And the moment the physical body awakes, it pulls the soul back. You come back into the body. And you know this to be so true. Because when you wake up in the morning, the times that you have come back with very lucid and vivid images from your astral experience, also known as dream, you may have vivid lucid memories, you may have a clear picture of the events, the sequence, the actors, the circumstances of everything that transcribed in your dream, but then you move your body just a little bit, you sit on your bed, everything is gone. The memories are erased. So you have seen how the physical body comes back. How is it that you open the eyes of your physical body, you realize that you're inside of it, but the moment that you move a little bit because that, that, that astral body has not settled in completely, those memories, gone. The angel of death will sever the thread of Antakarana. The moment that thread of Antakarana is cut, your soul cannot come back into the physical body. It just can't. That means... That if you cannot come back in the physical body, and we know that there is a personality associated with the physical body, a vehicle that you have been using for the last 20 or 40 or 60 years, it is a very good energetic vehicle. And this energetic vehicle corresponds with the physical body for the sake of interaction. If the, if the angel of death cuts the thread of Antakarana, then what happens to the body? Because the body, we know that it, can, it doesn't have the ability to still stand up and continue walking around, even if it's gibberish and, and, and doing clumsy things, just talking to others. The moment the angel of death severs the thread of Antakarana, the shock of the ray of death is so intense that it displaces the vital body outside of the physicality. And when that happens, there are some aspects of those four ethers that come into play and contribute to allow the physical body to degrade, to decay, so that it satisfies the principles of a cosmic law known as the cosmic trogo auto egocrat. This is the cosmic law that says that everything nourishes from everything else. Today, you eat something, and tomorrow, well, you are the one consumed. This is what the law is saying. The angel of death shows up, and at the time of death, it severs the thread of Antakarana. Your soul cannot come back into the body, and the shock of the ray of death displaces the ethereal body, activating and allowing for some functions to kick in so that the physical body can then disintegrate. So what goes to the cemetery because the soul is not there the soul remains within the lower half of the fifth dimension dear friends to the cemetery goes the physical body the ethereal body and the personality these are the three elements that go into that tomb to that grave 
as the physical body decays, the ethereal double, that is a mirror image of the physical body, that ethereal double starts looking exactly like the physical body is looking. And because the ethereal body is not bound to the physical body, it remains within its close proximity. And, listen to this, and those specters that people see in the cemetery, they are seeing the image of vital bodies that are reflecting the condition of the physical body itself. As that physical body decays, as it runs out of energy and all of its decaying processes, the ethereal body slowly dissipates. And the personality, because the personality finds its energy source within the physical body, as the physical body decays and runs out of an energy source, the personality slowly disintegrates. There is no future for the personality. If at any time anybody has said, you have a strong personality, and you have felt good about that, allow us to tell you, no need. Because there's no future for the personality. The personality is born in its time, and it is done at its time. And beyond that, there is nothing else. The key thing here is that the personality being an energetic vehicle and being part of so many experiences that it lived throughout the time span of existence. Because your lunar soul, that conglomerate of many psychological aggregates, many egos, used that personality to interact with the environment. Well, that provided the personality with some degree of knowledge on how to manage the ideoplastic and as a consequence, as the body goes to the grave, the personality will make use of the ideoplastic and will create an environment in that grave that would be very similar to the environment in which it existed at the time that it died. So for many, that grave, from the perspective of the personality, would look like a hospital room. For others, it would look like an office. For others, it would look like a park. For others, it would look like the inside of a car. It, they, they will, they, it, it will alter the ideoplastic to create an environment that remains familiar. This is what remains in the cemetery. And all of that will exist until the body decomposes enough that as a source of energy, it is considered negligible. The ethereal body would dissipate and the personality would disintegrate. Friends, this is what remains. But there is something that moves on. There is something that transcends. And what continues to our next life is that lunar soul. It is the combination of all of those positive and negative values that we carry within and inside each one of those values. Inside our anger, inside our lust, inside our envies and our greeds and our prides and our gluttonies and our laziness. There will be fragments of this consciousness. Whether the values are positive or negative is irrelevant. The consciousness is trapped and that is what continues into the next life. But something happens on the immediate three and a half days after the moment of death. We remember that when the great master Jesus resurrected, he resurrected after three days. We know that our serpent of Kundalini is wrapped around itself three and a half times at the very base of our spine. You see, this period of three and a half days is very significant. But in the case of the soul, our soul goes through three particular judgments during those three and a half days. At the moment of death, there is a first judgment in which the consciousness revisits all of its life in an instant. 
and some of us have already experienced that first judgment, maybe more than once, those quote-unquote near-death moments that we have had, near-fatality, near-accident moments that you say, wow, my life just flashed before my eyes. That is that. And the purpose of this first judgment as an exercise of retrospection is for the consciousness to be made aware of the consequences of all of its creations. The purpose of the three judgments is bring back a shock into the consciousness itself. And that is the first judgment. But the second judgment is a little bit more aggressive. The second judgment invites a deeper retrospection. And slowly the soul revisits all of its life. It just does it backwards. And it revisits every action. And it revisits every thought that came to those actions. And it revisits every emotion associated with those actions. In every space and in every location and everywhere that consciousness ever was for that lifespan. Revisiting all of those actions is a very harsh judgment. Even today that we find ourselves still fortunate enough to be still incarnated to still be breathing, to have the luxury of sitting down and listen to this lecture. Even today, in the favorable condition that we find ourselves, there are many things that exist in our mind that we would rather not go back and look. Things that we did, that we said, that we have chosen to keep them hidden because there are so many sufferings associated with going back to that. And while we're here, well, we can make pretend that those things don't exist. And we can make pretend that if we don't look at them, well, they will not bother us. But when the second judgment comes, our consciousness is going to have to revisit all of those moments of indiscretion. All of those inferior decisions. All of those instances where we encouraged and agreed and did and invited others to do things that did not contribute the consciousness needs to make itself aware of the consequences of its own creative power. And that unconsciousness has a very profound effect. Certainly, that second judgment is a huge shock. Once the second judgment is completed, then that soul is presented before the archons of karma once again. And whether it is immediate or immediately, that soul is going to be sent back into a new womb. There are only just very few people who have been so remarkable in this life that they will be granted a vacation. Whether it is in the realm of causes, in the causal plane, or in the realm of the mind, in, that, in those heavens of the mental plane. And that consciousness will be there, and it will impregnate itself with the perfumes of those great masters. And it will come back with a tremendous longing, with a fire of yearning, of transformation. And it will come back and work very actively. But those are just a very select few. Most people will return immediately or immediately into a new womb. And yet some others are going to descend into the spheres of hell. And the descent into the spheres of hell is not meant to be a punishment. It is because those aggregates have grown to be so dense... They have become such an obstacle for the progress of the consciousness that some of those aggregates will be sent by the Divine Mother, by the law, into the spheres of hell so that the forces of nature can do what the consciousness was unable or unwilling or incapable of doing while it was incarnated. 
the Divine Mother will help us eliminate our defects here. If we work with her willingly. But if we don't, it is the fifth aspect of the Divine Mother who will still have to deal with those defects. And she will do it with and as the catabolic forces of nature in the spheres of hell. Friends, this happens because the purpose of the consciousness being incarnated is to give the innermost a series of experiences in a realm in which the innermost cannot just show up and participate. The innermost is so powerful. As a citizen of the galaxy, it is such a magnificent, powerful being that if it had the ability just to get into your body, with your body not being ready, your body will not be able to tolerate that magnitude, that power, that energy, and your physical body will just be done. The innermost needs to dress itself with the right garments to be able to exist in the right realms of nature. And here, in this kingdom, this realm of Asia, that is the plane of substance, this is, the, this is pretty much the densest aspect of creation. Below us, we have the spheres of hell. Yes, there is a third order of cosmos underneath. Yes, that is true. There are, there are many more laws in those inferior realms that are, make, make things chaotically mechanical and bring about a lot of destruction. Yes, yes, that, that, that's true. But at this realm in which we operate in 48 laws, the innermost needs of this garment of this vestment to be able to operate here. And this is why the consciousness that is a fraction of the human soul of the innermost, that essence, that divine aspect that exists in us, that is what we have incarnated of the innermost itself. And we are here, and just as you see this image on the screen, we are standing at the threshold. We can face in one direction and we will contemplate the path that leads us back into the Garden of Eden. Or we can turn around and we can face the path that would lead us into the spheres of hell. Because this realm of Asia, this kingdom of the dense substance, it is that interface between hell and the upper heavens. As we stand here, we have the option of make use of the phenomena of death to propel ourselves forward. And that means for us to make a revolution of the consciousness, to make use of that creative power that exists within us, to eliminate our inferior aspects so that the consciousness can be liberated. Because if the consciousness becomes liberated, it does not just go to space randomly. It comes back and it coalesces on itself. As the great alchemists wrote, solve et coagula, dissolve and coagulate. Dissolve your defects, dissolve your inferior nature, and the consciousness will come back to itself. If we do this, we can transition from this realm of Asia, of dense substance, into a realm of formation. That realm of formation is made of three specific worlds that is also known as the realm of magic, of natural magic. It is, in Kabbalistic terms, known as the realm of Jetsira. And here in the realm of Jetsira, we have the fourth and we have the fifth dimension of nature. In the fourth dimension of nature, we see the angels of life. These are many of them her members of the hierarchies of Archangel Gabriel. And in the fifth dimension, well, we see the angels of death. They are angels from the hierarchies of Orifiel, Archangel Orifiel, whose embodiment is Saturn, the moon, and Saturn. As we move up the tree of life into the realm of Jetsira, this plane of formation, 
We can go one kingdom higher and we can walk into the realm of Bria, which is the plane of creation itself. Bria is the realm of the innermost. It is there where we see the human soul of the innermost, but also the spiritual soul of the innermost and the innermost itself. It is there where we see this combination of Atman, the innermost, our spirit, and Bodhi, the spiritual soul. Or Samael says that Bodhi is the, the container of alabaster that holds the flame of the innermost. And beyond Bria, we can reach the realms of the crown of life. That space of creation where the only manifestation that exists is that of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. That is the realm of the Asi, of Asilut. That is known as the realm of the archetypes. That is the realm of the gods and the goddesses. We can use the phenomena of death to avoid continuing the cycles of existence coming back here over and over and over again, extinguishing our lives and descending into hell to start once again. And instead of just going with the death of the physical body, we can use the phenomena of death and apply it to our inferior aspects so that we can be propelled forward into creation. And this is why we are given the opportunity of 108 lives. Because those who return immediately or immediately to a new physical body, they will be taken by the hand and they will be taken to this very particular location. Well, there would be the howl of the winds of the hurricane. And there would be thunder and lightning. And in that shock, because we are so fearful. Rather than facing courageously and exercise heroic action. That soul will seek shelter in one of those caves, one of those caverns. And the moment that happens, that soul suddenly realizes that it's taking a deep breath. And the next thing that comes out is the lamentation and the crying of the creature as it comes to experience the light of the sun for the first time. Friends, for that to happen, the angels of life have to intervene. And the angels of life are responsible of connecting that soul with a new zoosperm at the moment of those intense experiences of love that that couple is manifesting at the moment. As that soul becomes connected the connection goes from the soul itself into what would be the heart of the new creature. The consciousness will see the experience of being absorbed into the new body. But that consciousness will not be absorbed into the new body until that sperm becomes inundated with something that is called an electropsychic design. This electropsychic design is responsible of bringing many aspects of our past lives into the new future personality. The personality that we have today is really not that different from the personality that we had in our past life and in the one before. It is just that it continues to be developed uh, hardened by the repeat of many events with consequences, good ones and bad ones. But that electropsychic design comes to us and it materializes at the moment of death. With the shock of the ray of death, the, the severing of the thread of Antakarana, the shock that allows the vital body to be displaced and put into function, other activities in the body, that moment, concurrently, that electropsychic design materializes and it becomes then impregnated in the future fecundated egg. 
at the time of birth, at the time of birth, as the physical body of the new creature takes its first breath, the consciousness comes into the body and the ego remains hovering around the creature. And all of our defects hover around the creature, some of them positive, some of them negative, and the consciousness in its purity will be able to see and perceive all of those creations around it. Now, it's easier to understand why is it that some babies cry? And it is so difficult to understand the reason why they're crying. Because slowly, as that creature grows, the egos enter into the new body through the opening on top of the head, that little door of Brahmarandra. And eventually, by the time the creature becomes a toddler and turns to and that Doro Brahmarandra seals and closes, by then all of the egos are already inside the body. So when you see a little child that is roughly two years old and is an expert in lying, it is not necessarily an indication that the parents are lying in the house all the time. It brings all of those bad habits from past lives. And the angels of life, angels of the fourth dimension, are responsible of creating that connection. On the other hand, the angels of death exist within the, within the fifth dimension of nature. The disincarnated souls exist within the lower half of the fifth dimension, but the angels of death exist in the higher realms of the fifth dimension. And they are beautiful angels. Samael says they are beautiful damsels. They are beautiful children. They are beings of tremendous power and beauty. But they have to get dressed for their sacred office. Just like the police officer dresses in his uniform and the doctor dresses with his scrubs, the angels of death need to dress in those garments of the sacred office. And we see that they look eschatological and they look shocking, but the intent is to give a shock to the consciousness at the moment in which they are officiating. In his book, Yes, There is Hell, Yes, There is Devil, Yes, There is Karma, in the chapter, The Law of the Eternal Return, Samael says, It has been said that an electropsychic design based on the personality of the dead person is projected from him in the precise moment of his death, that is, in the very last moment when he exhales his last breath. That electropsychic design continues within the super sensible regions of nature, and from there, this electropsychic design saturates the fecundated egg. Thus, this is how, when our remnant values return, when they reincorporate within a new physical body, we come to possess the very similar personal characteristics to those of our previous life. And we are so fortunate to have so much technology available at our hands today. Because all it takes is a little search. And there are so many articles. There are so many videos. There is so much footage of young children who have tremendous, vast knowledge about topics that children, theoretically, should never know about. Children that are two, three, five years old who can sit before a grand piano and play the great compositions of Bach with their minuscule hands. Children who uh, have the ability to walk into a pilot's cabin in an aircraft and speak about the function of some flaps and the function of some elements of the aircraft and, and some emergency response procedures that pilots must go through to minimize any accidents. And this is all because as part of that electropsychic design, we bring forth very similar personal characteristics to those in our past life. So let's refer once again to those three judgments. Because many times you have participated of our Gnostic lab of practical application. And many times together we have come united as a single family to do exercises of retrospection. Why is that? Friends, we need to do retrospection because we need to become conscious of what we're doing. 
we have to make ourselves aware of all of our actions, of our thoughts, of our emotions. We need to do meditation because we need to calm ourselves down. And we need to do retrospection because we need to become conscious of everything that has transcribed during the day. The exercise of retrospection that we do seeks to develop in us the ability not only to become conscious of what happened today, but soon enough, we will be able to remember what happened today and the dreams that we experienced the night before we woke up this morning. And even not too far from then, we will be able to remember what happened today and the dreams of last night and what happened yesterday. And then the dreams of the night before. And before you realize, you can start remembering many events that transcribe during the week, day or night. And even not too far from there, you will be able to start remembering what has happened throughout the month, day and night. And this all happens as a function of the awakening of the consciousness. Friends, we need to become aware of our own actions. Because we tend to say, I'm sorry that I did that. But then we forget. And we forget that we did it. And we forget that we apologized. And we forget that we promised that we were not going to do it again. And we forget the suffering that we put others through. And we go back and we repeat the same mistakes over and over again. No wonder there is so much trouble in marriages. No wonder there are so many friends that just walk away. We need retrospection because we need to be conscious of the consequences of our own actions. The more conscious we become of that, the more conscious we walk forward before taking action because we have observed how we are feeling, how our body is responding, and what is going through our mind. We need to make use of that heightened awareness to invoke of the power of our Divine Mother Kundalini so that she can bring death to these many inferior aspects of us that keep us bound in this wheel of samsara. And we would like to close with a fragment from the legend of Zoroaster because this is what we are facing all those whose good deeds exceed their sins by three grams, they go to heaven. Those whose sins are greater, to hell. While those who carry of both the same remain at the Hamistikan, heaven, unto their future body or their resurrection. We need to make sure that uh, our good deeds will always exceed our sins. And on top of that, that we are making use of the phenomena of death and the serpentine power of our mother so that we can get rid of the causes of our sins by themselves. Dear friends, we source the material for this lecture from Samael's works, his book on fundamentals of Gnostic education, the mystery of the golden blossom, the book of major mysteries, the book called Medicine and Practical Magic, and his book, Yes, There is Hell, There is Devil, and There is Karma. Dear friends, thank you so much for joining us this evening, and may all beings be happy.